that. I'm a chemistry professor here at St. Bonaventure University, and I'm a theoretician, so I use computations to try and explain different chemistries that are observed or to try and help people explain um, why a process is working better or worse than they think it should. So the way I got to where I was, um, I, I was all set to actually go to Alfred University. I applied to a handful of schools and one of them was a safety school called SUNY Fredonia. And I had no interest in going there at all. Their swim team was trying to recruit me and I, I figured out that I could go on this recruitment trip and get out of a couple of days of school. So I was really excited to do that. But then when I went to Fredonia and I spoke with the faculty members, I realized what like a, a hidden gem Fredonia was for chemistry. So what I would suggest is, is as you're interested in these schools, even if it's a school you, you wouldn't even pr predict yourself going, talk to the faculty members because they can really give you clear insights on what the school's about and how, how the department's gonna take care of you during your intellectual journey while you're at college. Uh, the other thing is, is I knew I really liked chemistry. Those who uh, uh, go to Allegheny Limestone that Mr. Johnson is there now. The person before that uh, was Mrs. Taylor. She was awesome. I loved her as a teacher. So I ended up really liking chemistry. Then when I was in college for chemistry, uh, I had opportunities to TA, teach and tutor. And I realized I really liked that. And then also coming from a smaller school, I had opportunities to work in the lab. And I found I really liked that. Now, when I got the, to the end of my uh, bachelor's degree, I had worked a handful of jobs, which I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, I decided to go on for my PhD. And you might be thinking that is a huge cost. Like graduate school courses are extremely expensive. Uh, how did you afford that? Uh, I, I had pretty much a full ride to my undergrad, so I had no debt. And I didn't want to take on any more debt. So uh, what I found out was, is you can actually get your PhD paid for. I got paid about like somewhere in the range of 26 to $30,000 a year to go to school. And most uh, PhDs in the sciences will actually pay you to go to college. So they'll pay you to go on to get your PhD. You'll probably have to teach or be on like um, a research assistantship or a graduate assistantship. That's where you're like fixing instruments and things for people. But that's how you pay your way through grad school, which I, uh, going in, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, that's even why if you look at our, our chemistry majors and our biochemistry majors, the majority of them end up going to medical school, but there is a percentage of them that end up going to get their PhDs because it's really hard to look at education that is paid for and you get a salary for uh, and say, no, I don't want to do that. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is, is I'm extremely childish and I hate being told what to do. And the professorship job seems exactly, it's perfect for those people. They're, they're, if you've ever heard the term herding cats, that's exactly what it's like when you try to get a bunch of faculty members together. The other thing is, is I really enjoyed working on a computer. I liked working in terminal-based stuff. Uh, and I was really obsessed with the idea of atomic orbitals. So that's what these things are over here. And you may have seen them like in your chemistry courses and uh, what they're related to is, is where electrons are found. And I was always kind of surprised at why do we talk about these regions of space? Why can't we just say exactly where this is? And so that led me down the path to where I am today. And I've been involved with a lot of outreach programs in the area. Uh, the reason for that was, is if, if you're from the surrounding area, uh, you may know it's kind of um, like economically segregated. You have really poor people and you have really wealthy people and there's not too many people in between. Um, and my, my mother was an elementary math school teacher and my father worked at Dresser Ann as a pipe fitter. And so they really had no idea about science. Uh, I never really interacted with a scientist when I was a kid. So I try to go into these classrooms, give them an idea of like what science is, get them excited about it. Cause I never had those opportunities basically. In fact, when I told my father I wanted to be a chemist, he went, well, 
there are no jobs for that. Why don't you go and be an electrician? Like he, he didn't understand it. And my older brother, who was a ceramic engineer at the time, said, no, chemists are employed everywhere, dad. You have no idea. So if you encounter those things, if you have kind of um, not well-versed parents, let them know if you're interested in sciences, you're going to have a job at the end of the day. Uh, hydrogen is extremely valuable in terms of its energy density, meaning you don't need very much to get a lot of energy out of it. And it's the most abundant element in the universe. So part of my research is about storing this hydrogen in safe ways so it can be utilized for all sorts of technologies. So the way that we do this is through something called the molecular corking effect. So hydrogen, it's not found as just H by itself, it's found as H2. Um, and what we can have is, is something called a single atom alloy where you have a catalytically active metal. In this case, it's that palladium atom. And you can have a, a relatively inert surface that's cheap. So in terms of expense, palladium is way more costly than copper. But if you have a little bit of palladium on there, you'll get some catalytic activity. So what happens is, is that H2 comes in, it binds to that palladium, it ruptures the bond between those two hydrogens, and then the hydrogen scoots around on top of the copper surface. The benefit to this is, is uh, the, the copper surface and that, that H, it has a pretty strong interaction. So you, you won't get hydrogen just leaving the surface. Um, it has to meet back up at that palladium in order to come off. And atomistic hydrogen is not explosive or dangerous when it's on a surface. It's completely safe to store. Uh, but if these two H atoms come back together at that palladium right now, they'll, they'll spontaneously leave and it'll just make H2. So it's not a very good storage device then if it can just instantaneously meet back up and escape. So what we can do is, is we can use a molecule or a ligand to bind to this metal. And then we've effectively trapped that hydrogen on the surface. When we want to use the hydrogen, all we got to do is just kick that ligand off and then the H2 will come spitting back out. So um, right now, in terms of the temperature that this can be done at, uh, there, there are a couple different single atom alloys. There are ones with palladium and ones with platinum. Uh, the desorption temperature of hydrogen without a cork is around 200 and, or 210, 230K. And we want to utilize this stuff at a temperature that we can access. So that's not going to work. Even by throwing on um, carbon monoxide, we raise that temperature a ton, which is great, but it's still in a not usable range. So the idea behind what I'm trying to do is, is can we make this happen at higher temperatures? So really the only thing that's been investigated for a molecular cork is carbon monoxide, which is kind of bad because it's poisonous and um, it's dangerous to utilize. So I'm looking at another set of a class of compounds called N-heterocyclic carbenes. Sounds like a big scary name, but what it basically looks like is, is it's, a, it's a carbon ring with some nitrogens on it. And this is kind of a better picture of it where these are the nitrogens, the black spheres are carbons, uh, those are oxygens, and that's a hydrogen. And what I've shown is through my computations is, is these will actually work well as a molecular cork and it will drive it up in terms of the temperature at which the hydrogen will come off. So it could be potentially useful. So um, the goal is, is to try and develop these new corks and figure out what temperatures are they gonna come off and will they be useful to us? The other one has to deal with aiding in the identification of uh, bioaccumulative, toxic and persistent compounds. Sometimes we don't actually know what these compounds are. So two main examples that I have are polybrominated or polychlorinated uh, flame retardants. And another big one that's been coming up in the news a lot lately are PFAS or poly or perfluoroalkyl substances. So a little bit about the brominated compounds. Uh, we know that these brominated compounds have exist. They've actually been outlawed for a while. 
but you can still find them in the Great Lakes. They're, they're full of these flame retardants, and they've actually been outlawed since the 70s, but they still persist over a long period of time. The other crazy thing is, is these, um, these compounds, they actually get metabolized by your liver, which is right here, and they get uh, converted over to a hydroxylated metabolite. The problem with this is, is the hydroxylated metabolite is way more toxic than the initial compound. The other thing is, is we don't even know how to keep track of these things. We don't even know how to find them. So the big question is, is can we help aid in the identification of these guys? And then we can determine which ones are the most dangerous and which ones are not. Okay, but what about PFAS? So PFAS is another type class of compounds that we're interested in. They've been getting a lot of like, uh, a lot of bad press uh, in the news. Um, and th they're compounds, so all the health effects are being determined still, but this right here are the ones that we definitely know happen. Uh, what do we do here though? Like, how does the workflow happen? Well, the experimentalists identify a handful of compounds they think something is. They utilize a technique called liquid chromatography, and they can get like a fingerprint of compounds. Then what we do is, is we do some computations to try and uh, differentiate these compounds. And based upon those computations, we can line up either that fingerprint that these uh, instruments are spitting out, or we can identify where will they come out of the instrument. And that is actually tremendously helpful in narrowing down what might be literally millions of possibilities for these compounds to somewhere in the range of one to five. It makes the risk assessment way easier and way better without actually needing any analytical standards. So 